Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button if you guys are enjoying the content that we're throwing up. And uh, make sure you guys hit the like button if you enjoy the video. And yeah, let's begin. All right, what's going on, guys? This is Rob, and we are picking up with the official event of Joker War. And I love this story. Like, this is amazing. Here's the other thing, too. It's good to see Jorge. Here's the thing. I'm not sure exactly how it's pronounced. Is it Jorge Jimenez or is it Jorge uh, Jimenez? I'm not 100% sure how to pronounce it because I know that the J is silent in Spanish, but I think it's only silent under certain circumstances. So I'm not sure. But nonetheless, uh, we are picking up with, with the very beginning of Joker War. And this is a cool thing because what this does is it actually picks up years ago right at some point presumably in the early days of batman's career and there's a couple reasons why we can kind of pit this together and i'll talk about that here in a second but what's happened here is the various experiences of batman and dealing with the joker are starting to come to a head in the sense that all these individuals who are killed through the joker toxin are deformed in some pretty gruesome ways now the crazy thing about this is you don't really see people like that in recent in recent days right in, in recent years with the use of joker toxin right they just kind of seem to die with a smile on their face but with these really gruesome expressions and gruesome appearances it's messed up, but it's kind of cool to see at the same time, right? The, to kind of show the heinousness and the callousness of the Joker reflected in how people look when they perish at the hands of the Joker toxin is kind of wild. But one of the things that's going on here, of course, Alfred being alive, but Batman talking to him and Alfred kind of asked the question, how many has this quote unquote Joker figure already killed? And Batman kind of responds by, I'm not really sure this is going to end and that kind of a thing. So the discussion they're having is that they don't really fully understand who this Joker guy is or what he's about. And this all really points at the idea that they've just encountered the Joker seemingly for the very first time or in the very early days. Now, the reason why this matters is because we go back to Batman Zero Year and we go back to the origin of the Joker, at least some insofar as we got during the New 52. And we have this idea of when Batman first encountered Joker, that happened in the very, very early days of him becoming a superhero, right? So we're talking about within like the first two to three years of Bruce Wayne becoming Batman when, when, when this took place. This is very, very early on. But one of the things that Bruce Wayne picks up on pretty easily is that the Joker's motivations, as he said in Batman, the animated series, his schemes make sense to no one but himself. And that's what makes the Joker so dangerous. One of the things that Batman kind of picks up on here is that when it comes to the average criminal, they do what they do because of money or because of the thrill, right? Whatever the case is, like they do it as a contract killing, right? So it's it's like when Agnes Heller outlined the three reasons why people commit crimes, right? People commit crimes for profit, in which case the consequences don't matter. People commit crimes out of passion, right? Like some guy or some girl comes home and finds their significant other cheating on them, they lose their minds and stab them to death. Or they do it out of compulsion. They couldn't help themselves. But regardless of the situation, neither of these three things matter to the consequences. The third one seems to be what, what applies to the Joker. That for whatever reason, he sees the whole world as basically meat. In the eyes of the Joker, everybody's already dead. All he's doing is just kind of helping them along the way and then achieving his own goal in the process. But it's this really almost wholesome moment, right? When he's talking to Alfred and Alfred's like, there's no way I'd let you face off against a guy like this on your own for the rest of your life, right? And so what this does is it allows basically Batman to kind of break or at least you know the batmobile to break into an aqueduct for all that kind of stuff to go nuts right bruce wayne driving his batmobile but more so than that we get these sort of news blips right wayne enterprises is experiencing what's basically a hostile takeover in the sense that joker has taken over all the assets of wayne enterprises right that bruce wayne himself has basically indicated a kind of pattern of embezzlement siphoning money off of wayne enterprises illegally and then using it for personal means that harlan graves you guys know him as the underbroker from the the last few stories that we did he's the guy who's basically the legal counsel for wayne enterprises now and the other part of this is that the the gotham gazette received a multi-billion dollar cease and desist right so they were basically told if you don't stop publishing these articles saying the joker is the one who took over uh, wayne enterprises we're going to sue you guys into oblivion which of course the news ended up giving way because you know 2020 that's what the news does but nonetheless you know it's one of these things where the where basically from all different directions wayne enterprises in its entirety is now completely and totally under control of the joker and his henchmen right batman is uh, not only does he does he not have any control of his company he's wanted for embezzlement and so this guy's back is against the wall in almost every conceivable way the other part of this is that when it comes to lucius fox he's basically in uh, he's basically infected with the joker toxin not in the most extreme degree but just enough to where uh that punchline can get the kind of information that she needs out of him so she can relay it to the joker and what she wants to know are all the different locations that batman has within the city of gotham but more specifically within you know wayne enterprises that he can use at any particular point in time now again this is a great 
great way for James Tinian to actually feed off of what we've seen over the years from Scott Snyder's new 52 run. This is one of the things that Snyder brought in, where in the various buildings that were built by Wayne Enterprises or purchased by Wayne Enterprises, that Batman had put in these little, you know, kind of mini bat caves that he could operate out of in almost any situation, right? So no matter what the emergency is, he can go there and he can operate out of that place. And so where, where Lucius Fox kind of asked the question, where's the Joker gone to? Punchline says, where would you go if you suddenly became worth $100 billion? And so we pick up with the Monarch Theater. Now the Monarch Theater, for those of you guys who don't know, is a, is a significant place in the history of the Batman mythos. And the reason why is because this is the theater that Bruce Wayne and his parents were at when they left and they were shot to death in Crime Alley. And so you end up having the owner of the theater who's just kind of taking the, the Joker on a tour through this place, right? Kind of showing Joker around. And he's almost kind of explaining to the Joker what's going on, right? That this place used to be part of what was called Crime Alley. This is where the Waynes were killed, that you couldn't really walk up and down the street without having to worry about, you know, being being shot or something like that, which really sort of, sort of begs the question, why in the world did the Wade family go to the seediest part of town to see a movie theater, right? Was there just like not a theater close to them, right? That they could have gone to? Because let me tell you something, guys, in, in every town, there's two theaters, right? The theaters that rich people go to and the movie theaters rich people used to go to. Those are the two kinds of theaters that exist. I remember that was an old Chris Rock routine from back in the day, <laughs> but it's true, right? The rich kind of have a tendency to cut themselves off from anybody who's deemed to be not rich. So I guess maybe it does say something about the Wayne family that they spent time at, uh, at the Monarch Theater. But regardless, it's an explanation here by this guy and, and basically saying this place has a has a, a pretty rough history about it, right? Like there's almost a kind of spirit of, of vengeance, almost a kind of spirit of haunting that, that permeates throughout this place where it's just sadness and misery all this time because following the death of the Waynes and, and really kind of the collapse of this part of Gotham, nobody really goes there anymore. And it's kind of a crazy thing because even Wayne, you know, Bruce Wayne has shown up here a couple times and tried to buy this place and was always turned down every single time. And so where this, you know, owner basically says that he kind of hears what sounds like laughter, the response of the Joker is, well, it's probably just the wind, right? You know, old theaters like this, they probably have that kind of wind going through here. And so what we end up learning is that the Joker approached this owner with a massive amount of money. Now we're not given an actual numerical value, but we can kind of specify that it's enough to buy a small town, right? You know, so it was, it's probably in the millions, if not possibly in the, the, you know, double digit millions. It's an exceedingly high amount of money. And so what ends up happening is this guy continually kind of picks up on the fact that there's some kind of laughter here. And the Joker says, you know what? You should go join them in the audience. The show's getting ready to start. And this guy doesn't know what the Joker's talking about. Of course, the Joker's watching The Mark of Zorro, which is the movie that Bruce Wayne and his family were watching when they left the theater and they were killed. But basically we end up finding out that all these individuals out there who were Jokerized are sitting down in the audience. And of course this usher, this movie owner is gonna go the same way, right? He's gonna get Jokerized too. And that's basically gonna be the end of him. But again, it's it's kind of nuts because you have this scenario where Bruce Wayne finally makes his way into the Wayne Enterprises building. And when that happens, Happens, he kind of just starts looking around, right? Analyzing where the various people are, all the henchmen with guns. And it's the smartest move of the Joker to put in as many people here as possible, right? To station everybody on every conceivable floor. Not only that, because Batman basically gains access directly into one of the mini bat caves, one of the micro caves, he almost kind of assumes it's a safe haven. But as soon as the lights come on, you've got Punchline there who immediately goes after him. Now, here's the important thing to understand. Punchline has no chance against Batman, right? So before people start commenting, no way Punchline would win. Yeah, we know. Like, we know Punchline wouldn't win against Batman, right? At that point, you're just preaching to the audience. <laughs> you're just stating the obvious, right? Like, the sky is blue. <laughs> That's all it really comes down to. But it's, it's kind of a funny thing. And this is what I love about how James Tinian handles this. Because you've got Punchline on one side, you've got Bruce Wayne on the other. Under any normal circumstance, when I say normal, I mean Punchline being herself. And the only way she could win is she had the powers of Superman. She still comes out on top. And the reason why is because you have this moment where she goes and attacks Bruce. Bruce. And Bruce basically kind of implements these small little things here and there, these small little devices. But Punchline knows about all these, right? The booby traps and things that are there, this kind of iconic Batman suit that's there, right? Like this wholly new Batman suit that I've never seen before, but looks amazing. Like it looks so cool. It's almost kind of like a John Henry Iron Steel Batman suit, you know, like, like Superman suit, but for Batman. It's almost kind of what it looks like, right? Like, okay, here's what I want to know. Everybody watching this video, if you could name this Batman suit, what would you name it? You know, that's what we're going to call this video, the new Batman suit. Like if you could name this suit, what would you call it? That's what I want to know. Cause it looks cool. But the other thing, and this is why, this is why I love the way Tinian handles this is that again, like it's punchline in the room, Batman in the room, punchline is going to lose. But then we end up finding out that what she'd been doing here is Batman starts to kind of get a little hazy, right? Get a little foggy in the brain, a little sluggish. And punchline basically tells them, oh, what's actually going on here is that I have, I've been permeating this room with poison this entire time. It's one part 
Joker Toxin, it's one point Fear Toxin, and one point Venom. And the Venom, you know, the Venom basically prevents the Joker Toxin from killing you, but it basically enhances what goes on with the Fear Toxin, right? So it's kind of like this wicked cocktail. And this is genius, man. Like, it's so cool because the initial knee-jerk reaction to this would be like, no way Batman would go into this. But here's the other thing you have to, you have to understand. Batman wouldn't expect anybody to know that he has these little micro caves. They're probably not even on the blueprints, right? The only person who would know about it is Lucius Fox. And the expectation is that Lucius Fox is in hiding. Nobody would really be able to get to him in the conventional way. And so it's cool, right? Because it's just a way to kind of get the upper hand on Batman. The thing is like, once he starts making his way, or at least he tries to leave, suddenly he's met by the voice of Alfred saying like, hey, you're going the wrong way. You're going backwards. And when Batman's kind of like, Alfred, what in the heck is going on? Then like Alfred chimes in and says like, he's taken everything, right? He's taken the vehicles. He's taken your city. He's taken everything. You have to get out of there. And Batman looks up and realizes the Batwing is flying towards him, right? This Jokerized Batwing is flying towards him. And it's just, and Batman's like, what in the world? Like you're, you're supposed to be dead, right? And Alfred's response is, I'm sorry, my boy. I'm so sorry. We're all dead now. And that happens right as this thing open fires directly on Bruce Wayne, right? So like the Batwing looks like it kills Batman. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comics Explain, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like and I will catch you all later. Peace.